Hey guys, how's it going? Just thought I'd throw this video together really quick. I had this idea yesterday and it probably would have been better if I could have done it then on the spot when I was thinking of it, but I figured I'd wait until today and I'm actually going to do it now. So this isn't really meant to be a really great video or anything. I'm just kind of trying to get back into the motion of using the whiteboard and, and the camera and, and uh, all that, you know, from a distance and the lapel mic and whatever. Anyways, I was watching this video with James Battelle yesterday and somebody left in the comments about how James said something like Calvinists are enemies of the cross. And then they named off this long list of people who are Calvinists like Charles Spurgeon and others. And then he's like, you think those are enemies of the cross? Like, I don't think so. And, uh, and I was like, absolutely they are. Uh, and so I was thinking about what, you know, the case that I was going to build and I said, uh, that they, that Calvinists have another gospel, another Jesus, and another spirit. Okay. And I really think that that's true. And we could apply this to a lot of different, you know, other religions and stuff like that. Um, and people might think that I'm stretching it here, but uh, I don't really think so. So I think that Calvinism is a huge issue, uh, especially, you know, for me teaching the Bible because they take so many verses of the Bible out of context. And, you know, I've said I've been planning on doing lots of studies on them, and I do still this year. I hope that I'll finally get my first one finished and move forward. But uh, I do want to stay on it. Um, you know, Calvinism, it sucks because it's so popular. And, uh, you know, it's just thought of as Christianity, and it's just accepted. Um, but it really does teach, you know, another another God, basically, almost. Uh, you know, it teaches God as, you know, a more uh, cruel God than a loving one. And basically, Calvinism, if you don't know anything about it at all, the, the basically the basis, the core of Calvinism and the main issue with it is uh, that they teach that God... Uh, before creation, he already decided, you know, which individual people were going to go to heaven and which individual people were going to go to hell. Okay, he already chose them. Um, so people who go to hell, they go to hell because God already determined that they were going to go to hell, and they have absolutely no choice to uh, to go to heaven. They cannot repent. Um, they're just destined for hell. They're just destined for torment forever just because God just felt like it. So, you know, that should ring an alarm in people's heads and say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like a loving God. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't. And so that's what they teach. Also, you know, we can, we can say um, that Calvinism teaches that God is the author of sin. Okay. And they'll deny that a lot of times. Some of them will accept it. A lot of them will deny it. But most of them will teach. Um, there's a couple of ways that people go at Calvinism. You know, a real, true, hardcore Calvinist will basically teach hardcore determinism. They'll say that God determined pretty much everything. Everything that happens, God determined. If somebody gets raped, that was God's plan. Okay. If somebody, if a child gets murdered, that was God's plan. Every, every time. Everything was God's plan. Okay, Me making this video was God's plan. You watching this video was God's plan. <laughs> uh, you know, the good, the bad, sin, everything. Okay, So it makes God the author of sin. Because people don't really have choices to sin. According to Calvinism, uh, you know, God basically makes them sin. So why should they even be held accountable for it? And then they're being punished for it? So again, Calvinism has a cruel God. Calvinism reduces the, all of Scripture to foolishness, really, if we get down to it, okay? Um, you have to remember this because, because there's so many Calvinists and so many popular Calvinist teachers and even ones that I learn a lot from, John MacArthur, they can be right about a lot of things. Charles Spurgeon, yeah, even John Calvin himself, but they're severely, severely wrong about a lot of things too and you have to be aware of that. And I don't want you to fall into their system. Uh, it's false. And you're going to get a wrong view of God and yourself, a wrong view of salvation. Because they do have another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. There's a couple of verses that I wanted to look at. Nothing really too big, but 
Just Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. We're going to see where Paul talks about another spirit, another Jesus. Just a couple times. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Okay. And then he goes on to say, which is not another, but... There be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ, but though ye, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Okay. And then he says it again. If anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, and there's probably other verses that I should have looked up, but you know, I'm just saying this is just something that I'm throwing together, just to kind of just discuss Calvinism a little bit. To remind you, if you already know why it's so wrong, or if you haven't heard of it at all, maybe you'll get an idea of, of you know, the bad issues of it. You should already, from what I've explained. But Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. Paul said, For if he that cometh preacheth, preacheth, preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And basically what he's saying is he doesn't want you know the people that he's taught and converted to be drawn to another Jesus, to another spirit, or another gospel. That's a bad thing. You know, he said if someone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Okay? And we could say there's lots of other gospels. Um, there's a verse that I should have looked up. I don't remember exactly where it is in Romans. Should have it memorized. Uh, let's see if it's on my wall. Probably not right now. Let's see. Anyways. So, how I would say that Calvinism has another gospel is, you know, Paul says in Romans that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. And um, in Calvinism, the gospel doesn't really have any power. Okay, You see, we're to preach the gospel. Jesus said to go out and preach the gospel to, to everyone, to all nations. Um, and so, when people hear the gospel, you know, they get convicted by the Holy Spirit, and um, that's when they can be converted. Um, so people need to hear the gospel. Paul says that there is power in the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. But Calvinists don't teach that there's power in the gospel. Because, like I said, at the core of Calvinism, God has already chosen who's saved and who goes to hell. So what role does the gospel play in any of that? Okay? What role does preaching the gospel? Why? Okay. So they'll say, first of all, because Jesus told us to. Okay, yeah. Jesus told us to. That's a good reason to do anything, right? We should do what Jesus tells us to. We should obey the commandments. You know, try our best to, to live a godly life, to follow Christ. That's what we do as saints, as children of God. But, you know, why would Jesus have us go and preach the gospel to people who don't have the ability? It's absolutely impossible for them to respond to the gospel and to repent and to be saved. Um, so it reduces scripture to foolishness. Uh, the gospel really doesn't have a really a purpose. Okay, there's no power in the gospel, like Paul said, according to Calvinism. Um, and when we see, you know, that Christ says to go and preach the gospel, but we're preaching it to people who absolutely can't repent. They don't have that ability. They're destined for hell, no matter what. Why would Jesus, you know, he, we'd be wasting our time, absolutely. Um, so, again, it has bad impl implications for the character of God. Okay, and... Uh, so, so in one way, that's how we could say that there's another Jesus, because of how it makes God into a cruel mocker. You know, Jesus telling people to repent when they're not going to be converted because they can't be converted, uh, and He absolutely knows that. You know, it's like mocking somebody. Okay, <clears throat> but 
I'd make the case also that they teach another Jesus in the way that they teach that Jesus did not atone um, for the sins of the world uh, at his death on the cross. Okay, they teach a limited atonement. They believe that Jesus only atoned for those who God already chose, the individuals that God already chose would be saved. Okay. Now God did God did uh <clears throat> God didn't foreknow every individual that would be saved uh before creation. Okay, God knew who would be saved. That's different than saying that God chose and determined who was going to be saved. Okay. Because people do have free will. God also determined that whoever believed in Christ, whoever believed in him, <clears throat> would be saved. Okay. But that's still not the same as determining every single individual who's going to be saved and every single individual who's going to go to hell. Okay. Absolutely not the same. But I want you to make it clear that I'm not denying that God didn't know who was going to be saved and I'm not denying that God didn't choose that whoever believes is going to be saved. Okay. The Bible does teach that. So I'd say another gospel because they don't ha they don't teach that there's power in the gospel. It's really just a pointless message. Uh, men don't have the ca the capability to repent. Uh, they don't have free will. So the gospel going out and preaching the gospel is really pointless according to Calvinism. Okay, <clears throat> and it's really interesting too when there's Calvinists who will go out and they'll preach the gospel and say, you know, Christ died for all of you. But they don't teach that Christ died for everybody because they teach that Christ only died for those who God chose would be saved. So, you know, they're basically lying. They don't know if God died for them or not. Okay? It's absolute foolishness. There's contradictions. It just reduces the Bible into nonsense. It makes God into a cruel, controlling tyrant. Um, it just it creates confusion. And <clears throat> there's so much that's wrong about it. Um, you know, it also messes up sometimes you know, the relationship. It, it messes up passages that have to do with Israel and other things too. Um, <clears throat> so, let me think here. Let me take a drink of coffee. <laughs> So they teach a limited atonement. <clears throat> I want to say this too when we're dealing with Calvinism. There will probably be a lot of Calvinists that will watch this video. Maybe, maybe not. But they're very, uh, very stubborn, for one. And they're going to be adamant on saying that you're misrepresenting them. No matter what. You can study Calvinist work. You can study John Calvin. You can study R.C. Sproul and John Piper and John MacArthur and study them word for word. And I have their books and I'm going to. I'll show quotes. And no matter what, you're misrepresenting them. You're misrepresenting Calvinism over and over. That will be their argument. You're misrepresenting us. You know, you say, God is the author of sin. And they'll be like, you're misrepresenting it. or you know, But... That's not misrepresenting Calvinism. Okay, sometimes people do misrepresent Calvinism, so we have to try our best to really understand the doctrines, understand you know what they teach and where it is wrong, and and understand what is right. But there's always going to be that claim, no matter what. So don't let that get to you. You know, if somebody says that you're misrepresenting them, you know, examine yourself and your teachings and uh, take it into consideration. Maybe you are, but you know, if you really are set that you're not, then you know, you're not. They're just going to say that. Um, Calvinists, they're very stubborn. I get into a lot of heated debates with them. Uh, it really gets under my skin because there's just, like I said, there's so much scripture that's twisted and it, 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 redu it reduces the, the Bible into folly. And, you know, they're really, uh, a lot of them are just like followers of men. They're just going to follow James White and... Uh, R.C. Sproul or whoever, and they'll just take their word for truth, no matter what. Um, so they teach that, and so me saying that they teach another Jesus, and I say they teach that a Jesus, a Jesus who didn't die for the sins of the world, you know, that might be kind of stretching it. You could say they have another atonement, okay? 
But like I said, you could also say they have a, a Jesus who is mocking, a Jesus who is cruel. So there's lots of different ways to go about Calvinists having another Jesus. And I really believe that it is true. Um, so even the the atonement thing, I mean, it's bad anyways. So it's like error, error, error. But I'm just I'm just doing this as a neat way to to, re, to refute them, just to maybe give you something to remember when you're talking to them, um, to show like how bad Calvinism truly is. Jesus did die for the sins of the world, um, and Calvinists will say, "Do you believe that Jesus died for all sins?" And what they're going to try to get you to say is that Jesus didn't die for the sin of unbelief, which he didn't. Okay, Jesus said that the condition or the requirement for salvation was for people to believe in him. He said, those who don't believe are condemned already. Um, and then they'll say, well, we all, we all had unbelief at, in a moment or whatever. You know, before we were saved, we had unbelief. Uh, we might have moments of unbelief in some ways after we're saved, you know. Not totally, <clears throat> obviously. Uh, we'll stay in the faith once we're saved, but we might doubt that that you know God's going to come through on something or whatever. That's probably not even you know that's not how unbelief is mentioned in this context. But anyways, <sighs> you know, so belief is the condition or requirement for salvation. The Bible teaches that, and. So those who die in a state of unbelief, never turning to Christ, okay, they're not going to get that that covering for their sins, okay? They don't receive that atonement. You have to believe. So no, Jesus didn't die for the sin of unbelief, okay? To to stay in the state of unbelief and die in the state of unbelief. That's not covered in the atonement uh, because that is the condition or the requirement for salvation. Um, And we'll just continue on with another spirit. Another spirit, I'd say, is one of their points. Um, it's, I think, hang on a second. I say another spirit because they teach the irresistible drawing of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, which means that basically... We we see in the Bible where the Spirit draws people to Christ. Okay, um, you know it convicts them, you know it illuminates the gospel, and then people have that choice to turn to Christ or to reject it. And we see it get rejected in the Scriptures. You know we see verses where Jesus said that you know he wanted to save people, but they would not. You know they would not come to him. But Calvinism, since it teaches that God already chose who would be saved and who wouldn't, okay, he chose that people are going to be saved because he's making it happen. And no matter what, they're going to be saved because he already chose those individuals. <clears throat> so, when they come to, when they come to Christ, um, they teach that they are irresistibly drawn, that they cannot resist. They, they cannot, um, you know, that they, they, they will come to Christ no matter what. Um, but we see the opposite in scriptures, like I just said, times when Jesus said that, uh, you know, he wanted people to come to him, but they would not. And lots of other examples. Which is really interesting too, you know, because Calvinism, it's like, <clears throat> it's like God already chose who was going to be saved and who wasn't. <clears throat> but somehow, somehow everybody when they're born, they're like lost until God brings them into salvation uh, irresistibly and converts them, you know. Um, against their will, basically. People don't have a free will, according to Calvinism. And so, it's kind of confusing, but it's like, when do when do people get saved then, you know? Because 
we know from what the Bible teaches and from what should be common sense and stuff, people get saved when they turn to Christ, when they make that commitment. You know, I got saved, I turned to Christ. You know, because we know that people do have a free will and they can reject the calling or they can turn to God and accept that calling. Um, but with Calvinism, people can't accept it or reject it. So the question is really, when do people even get saved? How do we, how do we get to that? How do we find that point? You know, people talk about their testimony and stuff. Like, this is when I came to Christ. I can remember it. Okay. I can remember mine. You know, maybe not the specific day and everything. I didn't write it all down at all. But, you know, but I got the general idea of when I made this commitment and then my life was really radically changed. You know, there was a time, you know, and not just that, I, I stopped committing, you know, sins and stuff that I was doing at that time, but, you know, I started getting into the Bible and I really got a good relationship with the Lord. You know, I made that decision to live for Him, you know, which is what you need to do to get saved, okay? It's not just simply acknowledging the facts, okay? It's not just acknowledging that God can save and if you believe that, then you are saved. And it's saying, no, I'm going to live for you now, Lord. You are my Lord and you are my God. And I know that this is what I need to do and this is what I want to do because you're worthy of me worshiping you. You're worthy of me living for you. Okay, that's salvation. But with Calvinism, how can we, how can we find that point, you know, when a person got saved? How do we know? You know, maybe they were, maybe they can, they can say this point, they can say this is when I was converted or whatever, but, um, how do they know that they weren't before that or something? They just, they just didn't realize it. I mean, basically, they're already chosen to be saved. So, it's like in eternity and stuff, you know, I just... So, some people, some Calvinists will teach that people are converted when they're babies. Like, I think John Calvin taught, you know, conversion at, uh, at, at child baptism. If you're baptized as a child or whatever, then he'd say that you're converted. So, so there's some disagreement on that. There's disagreement between Calvinists on things. And there's some Calvinists who try to play the fence. And they'll try to say, yes, I do believe that God, you know, I do believe in the elect. I believe that God chose who was going to be saved before creation. But yet I do believe in free will and stuff. So they'll teach something that's called like compatibilism. You know, and like John MacArthur, he's one of those fence uh, Calvinist people. You know, I think that he real, does really good on Lordship Salvation and stuff. You know what it, what it means. You know to turn to Christ and everything, interpreting the parables and stuff like that. Of course, when he interprets it, his Calvinism into it, you know, there's error. But <clears throat> he's one of those fence people. Uh, there's a lot of those, really. Uh, but there's others who are kind of more honest, more accepting of their theology. Those are the ones who will teach that yes, God is the author of sin. They'll teach, you know. He does determine everything. Anyways, I hope you'll see that Calvinism just reduces Scripture just to folly. It just, it's a completely different Bible. I might as well just say another Bible as well. So, uh, <clears throat> in some ways, the whole Bible is the Gospel, kind of, too. So, <clears throat> I think you can make a good argument saying that Calvinism teaches another Gospel, another Jesus, another Spirit. And so basically you can just remember that, you know, the gospel and Calvinism has no power. It's absolutely pointless. God already determined who was going to be saved. You know, why preach the gospel? You know, people, according to Calvinism, don't have a free will to respond to the gospel. So it's foolishness. And it's it's not the gospel that Paul taught because he said that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And he's not ashamed of it. They teach another Jesus because their Jesus didn't die for the sins of the world. He only died for the sins of the elect. Also, their Jesus was cruel and mocking. Okay, and lots more could be said. Uh, but they also teach another spirit because their spirit irresistibly draws no matter what. The person cannot resist it. The person cannot uh, decline the call of the gospel. They have to accept because God's making them, and God's already determined all of this. So, just remember, Calvinism's bad. <laughs> okay? Bad. It needs to be rejected, it needs to be refuted. 
you know, like I said, I'll get into heated discussions with Calvinists, and you know, there's always this thought that you know maybe they'll see the light, and they could, but you know, a lot of times they're just so stubborn, so stuck in their way that you know you're just going to be arguing all night, and not much is going to come of it. But you know, it can help you though. I mean, it can strengthen your faith and what the Bible really teaches, you know, and you can begin to really see their error and stuff and see why it is so bad. So, I kind of covered some of the points of Calvinism here and here. There's basically five points that people will talk about, you know, uh, and it's it spells out the acronym TULIP. They start out with total depravity. They say, which is the beginning of Calvinism, and it's not, okay? Total depravity, they teach that everybody is so depraved naturally that um, basically that they can't repent okay which is not true okay everybody is born sinful but that doesn't mean that they can't repent the Bible actually teaches that we can so <laughs> um, then they have unconditional election okay um, so the unconditional election is how God already chose who was saved and, and who is lost. And that's really where Calvinism, that's really where the points start, is unconditional election. Because that goes back in the time, you know, before creation, you know, before time, um, God already chose. And everything stems from that. It doesn't stem from total depravity. Total depravity stems from unconditional election. So you got total depravity, unconditional election, and... Then, I'll spell these out too, maybe just so people, I'll write them down, just in case there's people who watch this who really don't know much about Calvinism. You know, I always assume that the people who are going to watch these videos have been seeing my videos or they already know about Calvinism, and a lot of people probably do, but maybe there'll be one person or something who might learn something just from me going over the points, so we'll see, we got... Let's see, tulip, okay. Let's see, you can see that, all right, tulip. So we got total depravity. And I hope I'll spell it all right. <laughs> total depravity, okay. Then unconditional election. Um, and then we have the limited atonement. That's what I talked about with another Jesus. Okay. Oops, why did I do that? So they, they basically teach that Jesus only atoned for the sins of the people who God already chose would be saved. Okay. And people don't have to repent or believe to receive that atonement uh, they just automatically will, whenever God decides to, irresistibly draw them, I guess. Or they already have it. I don't know. You know, I have to go into it a little bit more. It can be kind of complex, complex, I guess, this false system. They don't even know. They all disagree. Um... I probably spelled irresistible wrong. I R R E S I S T O. I think it's T I B L E. I want to spell it able. It's able. <laughs> irresistible, I think. Irresistible. Um, why can't I think about what that is? Let me just move on to the next one. <laughs> Perseverance. Perseverance. Probably didn't even spell that right. This isn't good, guys. I don't remember, is it irresistible drawing? It can be. I don't remember exactly what they call it, but that's what it is, too. So... Might as well. 
So here's the basic five points of Calvinism. And basically, you know, Calvinism is based on the teachings of a man named John Calvin who lived a long time ago, and he was basically a tyrant, and he wanted heretics murdered and stuff. People try to compare me to people like that because I have my false teachers list and stuff because I want to expose their false teachings. Now all of a sudden I want to burn them at the stake or whatever. No, absolutely not. Um, anyways, John Calvin was not really, you know, from his fruit, he wasn't really a follower of Christ, uh, but he had these bad teachings and... People got these five points from his teachings. They tried to like summarize things, even though Cal John Calvin taught contradictory things and stuff too. But you know, he also held on to some Catholics' beliefs. Like I said, he believed in child baptism, you know, infant baptism, baby baptism. I mean, um, so the total depravity. That's saying that men are so depraved that they cannot repent. Okay. But really, they can't repent because God hasn't gave them that ability. He doesn't allow them to because unconditional election teaches that God already chose who was going to be saved and who was going to go to hell. Okay, each individual. God chose them. It's not that God just knew who was going to be saved. God determined who was going to be saved and who was going to burn in hell. To Calvinists, God determined who was going to burn in hell from the beginning. Okay, they were born and going to hell with absolutely no chance of redemption. That's a wicked, wicked doctrine. Okay, and the limited atonement, these two stem from this. Okay, everything stems from this. Okay, it all comes from here. Now, I don't really have a huge problem with perseverance of the saints, um, so I won't tie that into that for right now, but... And the irresistible drawing, I said, is when a person believes the gospel according to Calvinism, um, it's, it's because they were irresistibly drawn. They had no, cho no chance of uh, refusing the gospel and you know, remaining lost until death. Uh, whoever God wanted to be saved is going to be saved because he chose them to be saved. And um, you know, where does this even fit in and stuff? I don't know. It's it's a mess. Um, so that's total depravity and limited atonement and irresistible drawing. They all come from God already determining who is going to be saved and who is going to go to hell. It's called unconditional election. So when Calvinists talk about the elect, they talk about the people who God chose before creation was going to be saved. That's the elect to Calvinists. You know, something else that I didn't mention in this video, there's so much depth into Calvinism that I want to get into it deep. And it's going to take some time. But, you know, they redefine words and stuff like grace and um, sovereignty and stuff. You know, it's like... How, grace is a gift, okay? The, the, the Bible talks about the gift of salvation, okay? And how it's offered to all men, okay? That's a gift. A gift, you know, you can choose to receive. But in Calvinism, with irresistible drawing, there's no way that you can reject that gift, okay? So it's not really a gift. It's more like it's forced. Okay, so that's not grace. Grace isn't something that you force on somebody against their own will. Okay, or they don't even have a will according to Calvinism. Some some of Calvinists say they do have will. Some say they don't. You know, and they'll contradict their own system and everything. So they don't even know. <laughs> but but grace isn't something that's forced on somebody. So they kind of like redefine grace. They'll redefine sovereignty. They'll say God is sovereign. Okay, what they mean is that God determined everything. That's not what sovereignty means. Sovereignty means that God is in control of everything, okay? There's not nothing that can happen that isn't allowed by God, okay? God allows things to happen. That doesn't mean that God determines everything to happen, okay? If God allows somebody to get raped, which is a horrible thing, this is a horrible example, it's extreme, I know, but we have to see how horrible Calvinism is. 
So if God allows somebody to get raped, that's different than God making somebody get raped, than, make, than God determining for somebody to get raped. Okay? There's a huge difference there. There really is. Uh, God determining for someone to get raped makes God the author of sin. That's what Calvinism teaches. God is the author of sin. Okay? To Calvinists. And um, so, that's their view of sovereignty, is that God determines every little thing. But that's not sovereignty. So they, they play these things where they change words. And uh, another thing they'll try to do, uh, like I said, they'll try to say that, uh, they'll try to ask, did God, did Jesus die for all sins on the cross? You know, you'll say, all sins but unbelief, okay? And then they'll think that they got you or something. Okay, so that's what they're that's what they're gonna come at you with. They're gonna come at you with, uh, you know, you're misrepresenting them. They're gonna come at you with, did Jesus die for all sins on the cross? And they're gonna come at you with, uh, let me think, getting ahead of myself. Okay, they're gonna come at you with this. They're gonna say, I believe that God saves. You know, God saves to the uttermost. Uh, you know, I. You know, salvation is of the Lord. You know, it wasn't it wasn't my choosing to be saved. I had nothing to do with it. Salvation is of the Lord. Well, salvation is of the Lord. Okay, nobody could be saved apart from what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't say to get that a person has to repent. A person has to turn to Him. There is a condition on salvation. Okay, so when we do repent, that doesn't mean that we saved ourselves. Okay, we couldn't be saved apart from what God did. We couldn't be saved apart from God's grace, which is grace. Okay, not forcing things on people. Grace is grace. Calvinist grace is wicked. Okay, it's not grace. So they're going to say, you know, I didn't save myself. You know, salvation had nothing to do with me or whatever. Okay, so it's true, yes, we do have to believe, we have to repent. That doesn't mean that we saved ourselves. That's what Calvinists are going to try to make you say. That's what they're going to try to make you feel, like you're saying, is that you somehow played a part in your salvation. No, salvation is of the Lord. Yes, we do have to repent. Okay? So, that's how it is. Calvinists don't like that, but uh, they're deceived, unfortunately. And, you know, it's just like the easy believism people. You know, they'll say the same thing. They'll say repentance is a work or whatever. You know, they don't understand the Bible. They don't understand salvation. And perseverance of the saints is basically that once a person is saved, once a person turns to Christ, that they are going to persevere in the faith. They're not going to leave the faith. So, in a way, perseverance of the saints is kind of like eternal security. It's like saying once a person truly turns to Christ, they're not going to lose their salvation. They're not going to become a Buddhist for the rest of their life somewhere down the line. Okay. Once there's a true conversion, they stay converted. And I don't see how anybody can really argue with that. Okay. I also think that saints persevere in holiness because God um, chastises uh, his children. And that doesn't mean that, you know, saints don't sin, uh, you know, or you know, get into slumps or whatever, but basically, you know, we're going to keep following the Lord, serving the Lord, get back up and uh, dust ourselves off and keep living holy for the Lord. You know, I agree with that. That doesn't really stem from all this. This is just what the Bible teaches, okay? They might use some verses wrong to teach this and stuff. There might be some little issues with what they teach on that, but basically, the Bible does teach perseverance, so basically, these three or these four, you know, are the bad ones. But this one is really the bad one. Unconditional election. This is where everything stems from. Okay, so that's what I said. That's the core. That's the basis of Calvinism. Is that God already chose who's going to be saved and who's going to go to hell, and there's nothing they can do about it. There's no chance of redemption for those that are headed to hell. God just wanted them to go to hell. I'm going to create you so you can burn for eternity. Does that sound like a loving God? No, it doesn't. Calvinism reduces Scripture to complete folly. Okay? So, but we'll go into more and more and more details. We'll look at all the verses that they use and twist to try to defend all these. 
And, uh, you know, I want to start with total depravity. I've had one working on that for a while. I hope, please God, that I'll get it done soon and uh, work on unconditional election. And once I go through all these points, and I'll even talk about perseverance, then we'll go on to other uh, things about Calvinism. We'll talk more about compatibilism and stuff. You know, I don't know what order I'll do everything in, but there's so much that needs to be talked about Calvinism. You know, we can talk more about how they make God the author of sin. We can talk more about how they reduce Scripture to foolishness, you know, specifically and stuff, make God a tyrant. Uh, so, blah, blah, blah. But Calvinism is bad. I pray that more Calvinists will convert to uh, true Christianity. You know, that's the problem, too, is that Calvinists believe that they're saved because they were chosen to be saved. They believe that people can't repent and turn to Christ. So, really, you know, they have a false gospel because of that. They're saying, you know, just trust, just trust that God chose you and you're saved. Okay, uh, no. But then there's people like John MacArthur who teach Lordship of Salvation and that you need to follow Christ and stuff, and he's right, but he's contradicting his own theology, really. So, um, you know, so I hope you understand that what I'm saying is that they don't teach believe on the Lord and you will be saved. They don't teach repent and be saved. Okay. They teach you are saved because God chose you to be saved. That's another gospel. That's another gospel. And if people really believe that, maybe some of them still teach that people are, you know, regenerated at birth. You know, when do people get regenerated according to Calvinism? And some people say, like, at birth, you know. So maybe there are some uh, Calvinists who teach their children that they were converted at birth and they just assume that or something, so they never repent and get saved. So it's a false gospel. It can it can definitely deter people from the true gospel. I mean, it does. Uh, but there can be some Calvinists who are saved. You know, they could be like new Calvinists. They just got saved and they got into the system. So that's why I'm saying it's not always bad to discuss these things with people. But you know, if you catch yourself, you're going into it like in an hour or something, and and you know, you're just the Calvinist is just still coming at you hard, trying to get you into Calvinism. Then you know, maybe it's just time to kind of step away. But everybody has to determine their own, you know, how far they're going to go and what they're going to discuss. You know, everybody's different and stuff. You know, I love teaching and love scripture, so. You know, I want to get into it and talk to it, but it can get stressful. And But like I said, there could be new converts, and maybe something that you'll say will click in their head. You never know. You know, so sometimes you just got to try. But it's good to study it and to talk about it just to reconfirm, you know, your own beliefs and what the Bible teaches and true salvation and who God really is. God's really a loving God. Okay, grace is really a gift. So I'm going to end this video here. Thanks for watching. Expect more soon, I hope. God bless.